Panama City. It's, uh, Panama City. Certainly Panama City in Panama, in, South, in Central America, where Manuel Noriega used to live. If you remember your news from the past, it's probably within your lifetime. Is this not... Uh, I was going to play it again, just because I can. Do I have to rewind it? Good question. It goes into nowhere, right? So it, it, it's pretty flimsy. So the zip line is actually made of wood. The connections at the top are made of wood, which is interesting. So it's probably just as well that wear parachutes, I suppose, because uh, it doesn't look that sturdy. Looks like it just goes into the harbor, right? It looks like the harbor. Yeah. There's a view from the top looking down towards where it goes in some sense. Okay, yeah. This is the first time I've ever seen that. I'm going to mess around. Yoko. I'm going to mess around. 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 I'm going to Everyone, notably, everyone who goes down has a parachute on them to do base jumping equipment, I guess. Like it's just Kurt Mantle uh, climbing rope that has some spring in it. Yeah. This long piece of rope. Alright, where are we doing the time? We're not bound by time, I guess we're going to be right now. 7.59. Well, you should realize that nothing is ever shown for no reason. So you should know coming into the final what a zip line is. Could be a external flow of tension. Yeah. So, 
certainly some people who don't think you can do it. So you can imagine, no doubt, what might come up with that. All right, uh, we've got two. Okay, so we've got two sessions left. Um, I think I'm not sure we need two, but uh, we have two anyway. Um, so what I suggest we do uh, is what we had uh, said we would plan to do, and that is go through a review on some materials. I'm not sure exactly how the time will go, um, but uh, um, the uh, the final set for Wednesday at 4:40. It's in here. Um, it's going to be crowded and sweaty because uh, I think uh, we still we've had a few people drop I guess but we start off you wouldn't believe it with 320 people so thanks for turning up <laughs> and um, so so we still have that order of magnitude of uh, people in the class I think the room takes 320 and so um, so so it'll be here uh, three questions it is comprehensive but I'll you know, I think it's fair to you that instead of wading through the 440 pages of uh, cryptic notes that we at least give you some focus for so for sure external flows are on there so for sure open channel flows are on there which is what we've just dealt with in the last uh, couple of weeks and we'll go through again today um, and also the other one is on pipe flow so material 10 and 11 weeks 10 and 11 nominal weeks 10 and 11 so uh, that gives you some way to at least uh, focus your uh, efforts. Um, I don't know if any, no, fine. You can ask questions as we, as we go along. Uh, so it's on that last part of the class and of course that's the, uh, the sharp end of the class in some respects because all the stuff that we've done uh, before that has really been leading us up to be able to do that. So we talked about uh, fluid pressures on, uh, at a point, fluid pressures on structures which are fluid statics, then we talked about constant Bernoulli's equation which is F equals MA uh, and comes out of conservation of uh, changes of momentum. And then we talked about viscous losses in the system to be able to look at the full spectrum. So the energy equation was that. And so now you take that stuff for granted. And of course, when we talk about uh, pipe flows, the head losses in pipe flows is the Bernoulli equation plus the energy loss term. So it's the energy equation. When we talk about external flows, we have this drag coefficient, which of course is the loss term as well, due to viscous or pressure drag. And when we talk about open channel flows as well, we have these gradients at the bottom of the bed, which is driving flow, gravity, which is the Z term. And we have the head loss term for the energy grade line. And so it all relates to basically Bernoulli equation with the energy loss, which is the energy equation. And that is what we use in each of those three topics for pipe flow, uh, external flows and uh, open channel flows. So, so as I say, it's the kind of the sharp end of what we want to be able to do. Everything has been building up to that point. So we've done this before. We maybe did this a couple of classes ago, but let's, let's do it because it sets things in perspective. And I realize that you probably just want me to tell you what the questions are and to work the questions for you, but we won't quite do that. But we'll use this to gain maybe some perspective on where this is, which you'll appreciate more in a year's time or two years' time, or five years' time, than you will right now, probably, right? And so I want to, to go through those three components. So I guess we're talking about um, uh, topics 10 to 11, which is pipe flow. And we're talking about 12. Perhaps I'm the only person who understands this, which is um, external flows. And it's not really 13, 14, because it's really 13, it's about a week's worth of, of open channel flows. And so you'll remember uh, our understanding of this, and it's easiest to draw it in, um, in figures, and that is for pipe flow, the most important figure we had. You will recall, and I'm going to draw these right on top of each other because that's appropriate for this. We have this thing called the Moody chart, friction factor. And 
and you should recognize all of these uh, terms that we're using. Um, Reynolds number we defined as the velocity in the pipe, the density, and a characteristic dimension. I guess was lower case hyd hydraulic diameter rather, and viscosity, which indexes these flows. We had uh, external flows. And uh, for that, what was it? It was very similar, right? These are going to repeat themselves. Reynolds number, I won't repeat it. What was this? This is either coefficient of drag or coefficient of lift. And again, was something like uh, you know, boundary layer effects. Uh, was this, um, I can't remember, this was, uh, say, 64 over Reynolds number for a smooth pipe, or it could be equivalent to some coefficient over Reynolds number, which would be 64 for a round pipe, but be different for other things. Um, we have a, a dividing line between these, and so uh, free surface flows, open channel flows, I guess, are the same things. <coughs> free surface flows. And again, this looked kind of similar, I think. All that was slightly different was that the expressions dealt with dealing with this. This is 1 over the Manning's coefficient. We never drew this diagram. We've never seen this diagram, actually. But we can imagine that it exists because these are just values for, uh, I, don't know. I don't know if this is in the right order, but glass, concrete, same deal. Uh, Reynolds number in this case is typically dealt with in terms of uh, hydraulic radius. So the scaling is velocity, density, hydraulic radius over viscosity. So that's the only thing that's different from this. We can choose whatever characteristic dimension we want to use. And uh, this, in the case of uh, hydraulic radius, actually it's the same number in terms of diameter, but in terms of hydraulic radius it's maybe 500, maybe this is 2,000, maybe this is 2,000 as well. Um, and the important things to realize in all of these is that they're, they're basically all the same uh, components. What's this? This was something like uh, for a sphere... It's 24 over Reynolds number. And so with these systems uh, go some uh, expressions to be able to, to do something useful. So for pipe flow, uh, for pipe flow, the expression is just Bernoulli. It's, uh, we always have to remember to go, no, you know this stuff by now, right? We always have to go from upstream to downstream. Um, we can have a pipe network which allows us to do this, right? So with a pump in it. I'm probably stating the obvious for you. Uh, we can have a pump energy input into the system. The energy, the, the stuff downstream is just the repeat of Bernoulli. And the sum of the uh, the lost terms, I guess major, and the sum of the head loss terms, 
which are minor. And for those component uh, behaviors, what do we have, if I can remember? I hate to be just a machine churning out equations, but I think you know how to, you guys know how to use these. The pump head, what is it equal to? It's equal to the power, which you can call it power if you want, times um, unit weight of water times Q, yeah, mass flow rate, right, times G, which I think is the same as, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, gravity times mass flow rate. We know that the uh, major losses are equal to this friction factor, scaled in an appropriate way. times the velocity in the fitting. So that's important. Not the velocity upstream, not the velocity downstream, because sometimes if those are big tanks, those velocities are zero. Uh, so this is the velocity in the fitting. And the minor losses uh, are just um, some loss coefficient, a number, again, times the velocity in the fitting. And so the important thing about this is if we make a, a line here, is that typically we assume that these head losses in the fittings are going around corners so sharp that you're always in this regime, uh, in this turbulent regime. Turbulence is induced in some way. And so this is just a number that's given. And uh, within the, um, the piping itself, then the velocity could be either laminar, which I didn't label here, but I guess we could do here. This is laminar. Don't you think my writing is fantastic today? No comment? Definitely got better? Good. I'm drinking less these days. It's helping. <coughs> Um, yeah, so it matters where we are on this. So the, the more difficult ones to solve are the ones with um, laminar because you have an unknown Reynolds number because you don't necessarily know the velocity and you have to solve for that. On this it's easy because it doesn't matter what the velocity is, right? Because it's just a single number. Yeah. yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, can be. If we're generalizing it, yes. And so this would also be the hydraulic diameter. Uh, if it's a non-circular section, etc., and to any other places it goes, no, that's probably it, right? I guess this would be R, E, H. So these would be equivalent Reynolds numbers as well. And I guess we never did, de well, we did define Reynolds number. So, so yeah, so we talked about type 1, type 2, and type 3 problems. Type 1 are easy, right? You have a flow rate, so you know intrinsically the Reynolds number, and so the question is to calculate how much power you have to apply to, to be able to push stuff down there, or what the head loss is. So those are the easiest ones to do because de facto you know where you are on this axis and so wherever you are, wherever you are on this axis you have a number for the friction factor, whether you're laminar or whether you're turbulent. If you're turbulent, it doesn't really matter. As long as you're bigger than 2,000, you know that if it's a, uh, a glass pipe, a glass tube, that if this is the E over DH for that, then this. I guess the other thing that remember is that there's this, this goes in the definition of a smooth pipe. This is the, the smooth uh, pipe. One of our euphemisms, like big tank, large tank. What's that mean? It means the velocity is zero if you put yourself on the surface, right? Smooth pipe means you're on this curve here that's a single curve on the Moody chart. Okay? All right. Um, so, so that's pipe flows. Uh, driven by pressure. Uh, <coughs> Gradients or gravity drainage is, is in, inconsequential, really, in terms of the numbers, although we, we include it in here as this component Z. When we look at external flows, uh, really all we worry about is that we can define either drag or lift as equal to um, some non-dimensional coefficient. So this is a non-dimensional coefficient. 
a, a curly D, which is a force, half times density rho V squared, I think we call it U squared, and a characteristic area. And so if this is, this is the equation for a sphere in this particular case, um, then the area for this, if this is D, then the area is the characteristic area, which is pi D squared upon 4. So it, it's an area that depends really on the, the system, right? So if you have a, a plate which is getting the, the jet engine wash from a, a San Francisco International, then it would be the face, face area of the plate. If the plate was this way on and you're looking at the, the pressure drag on the tip, then it would actually be the area of the edge-on part. So it matters what the, the aspect is to be able to, to define what you're looking at. Um, equivalent magnitudes for lift would be the same, right? So it's just the same expression. Oops. Of course, this is curly L. Oh, I could do the curly L is much better. It's curly L. And it's a half, uh, again, the, half, the same units. Density, velocity squared times whatever the area is. This term, of course, is the momentum you're killing. It's V squared over 2G. You're hitting the plate, stopping. That force is being applied to the plate. And so it's really not any different from us doing those examples uh, a long time back, looking at um, what the external velocity was where it comes out of the <coughs> nozzle of the jet engine. The velocity it is when it hits the plate, which has to be zero, stagnation. And you can use that difference in velocities to be able to calculate the force. Um, the other thing that you can use this for, and which we have, which we'll go through a couple of examples, is you know the quick, the easiest example, and it falls into two categories. Is this? Uh, we'll go through it today. Is stoke settling? So you have a weight of something. You have a drag force acting around it, squ squirrely d. Maybe you have a buoyant force which we know, volume times unit weight of the fluid. And you can just resolve those as W is equal to FB plus D, squirrely D. All the same units all have to be, you know, it seems so trivial now. We're talking about it the first, second time we met. Add apples to apples, dimensional homogene homogeneity. So you take that for granted now. And so I guess the the issue, not the issue with this, but the reality is that it matters when you're doing this that the drag force is going to be some function of velocity squared, but it's also some function of where you are in the Reynolds number plot. The easiest ones would be over here, where this drag force is about, I don't know, it's about half. And so this doesn't matter. Don't care about this blip. This is this boundary layer shedding type thing, von uh, von Karman vortex street type things. And in this, it it varies with Reynolds number, which is a bit more complicated. But it matters whether the flow is turbulent or laminar because when you solve this expression, you'll end up with a function either as a function of velocity squared, or as a function of velocity. <coughs> Stokes settling it comes out just to be velocity. Um, which is in this lambda regime. If it's a, a person, if it's Baumgartner hurtling through the atmosphere at uh, 300 miles an hour, then it's probably turbulent. And then actually it's a simpler one to solve because you just have a single value of the coefficient of drag. So they, they end up being solved in different ways. So in your examples, you have an example of um, stoke settling, dropping a small ball into a liquid and seeing how the velocity uh, the steady velocity uh, evolves. It'll accelerate to some steady velocity, and that's controlled by the viscous drag. Uh, if you're looking at hailstones in a cloud, which is the other example which uh, are in the notes, then you have the updraft lofting up the hailstone, and you know the equilibrium being the, the updraft being exactly holding the hailstone in exactly a single place, then in that particular case, you're on this side of the regime. It's air, it's almost certainly turbulent, and the equations are slightly different, but you still work with this equation. So just have that there. Okay?
So that's 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 what we're interested in. So in this case, we want to know what head losses are, how we can put force things through pipe. Typically, in this, we'd like to know either what the forces are on structures, drag or lift, whether you can lift it, or we'd like to be able to calculate what the equilibrium velocities are if everything is in balance. So, which is what this is. And then finally. Um, when we look at free surface flows, what we've done is we've taken this expression here and we've slightly rewritten it. Uh, it will be fresh in your minds. We've written it as um, upstream elevation plus upstream energy is equal to downstream elevation plus uh, downstream energy. I guess plus uh, the slope of the free surface uh, of the um, energy grade line multiplied by length. I think that's dimensionally homogeneous. Uh, we've also taken um, the Z, Z, we've written it different ways, uh, but let me just define this term here. And, and as a convenience, what we've done is we've taken this section And we've defined the flow rate per unit width. So this is a unit width section. And what is this? This is y plus q squared over, is it 2gy squared? I think so. If it's not, we'll find out sooner or later. And we've also written this expression as um, energy upstream plus, sorry, don't want this to become an alphabet soup of equations, but I will guarantee that you, you won't need an equation that we haven't talked about today in class. Of course, if we talk about every single equation, it doesn't help you much. But. And this is, I think, the surface energy grade line slope minus slope of the bed times L. So confuse this. So this is the energy grade line slope. And this is the bed, which is just um, S0 over 1. So. And that's OK. So we've talked about that. But I already told you maybe that uh, perhaps that we might not need to worry so much about this. Uh, so the other part of this, I guess, is the if we look at the easy behavior, so this is for GVFs, gradually varying flows, right? This. If we look at uniform flows only, maybe perhaps more important, we might like to look at that, in which case we have the, the Chezy formula or Manning modification. And yes, you know, relatively straightforward, which is that the velocity, average velocity, I suppose it is, in the channel, is equal to this uh, dimensional scaling parameter. It's one for SI. We only use SI. I think it's 1.49 if it's feet per second, 1.0 if it's meters per second. We have to worry about units for this. We use a Manning coefficient, which is this term here, which we never look at it this way. It's just a number that we know from a chart. It's the hydraulic radius to the two-thirds, and it's the bed slope to the half. Same bed slope as in here. And I suppose the only other thing that we might want to de define is that this is the perimeter. This is the area, and that hydraulic radius is equal to area over perimeter, just by definition. <coughs> so that's useful, worthwhile knowing. So this is average velocity. Of course, you can get the volumetric flow rate by just multiplying the average velocity by the cross-sectional area. So you know certainly how to do that. This is a masterpiece. Mm, great. And so you might want to understand how to do uh, uniform flows. The only thing I'll add to that is that we talked very briefly uh, about the importance of optimal sections. 
optimal sections would be the sections that you define if you want to get the maximum flow going for uh, for a given depth for a given depth of flow and those would be uh, rectangular channels which is twice as wide as it is high triangular channel that has whoops has an equilateral is not an equilateral triangle is it it's um, got a right angle triangle in it and a circular section which is bankful and this is just boy. so in each of these cases the depth of flow obviously is y this is y in the middle this is y in the middle as well I'm not sure that matters but so that's worthwhile giving a thought to we haven't done it otherwise in this class but I'd, I'd have a look at that right. so. so I would guess I don't think there's anything that you need that isn't covered on that page uh, in terms of expression of course you know how you need to know how to use it but at least I'm trying to frame it in terms of uh, the physics that's going on. I think it's quite interesting to be able to look at things in this way that these are really just the three diagrams. One happens to be when you're driving flow in a pipe by pressure upstream versus pressure downstream. Gravity isn't important. External flows, you're dri driving thing again by pressure upstream, pressure downstream with an obstacle in the way. Uh, could be an airfoil, could be a building, doesn't matter. Uh, and you're interested in the force that it applies on that building or uh, the other way of looking at it is looking at the force that's applied on the building to be able to look at balancing the other drag forces with the velocity, uh, to be able to calculate the velocity of a falling person or a falling um, grain in Stokes flow. And it matters whether you're on the laminar, the Stokes side of this, or the turbulent side. And when we talk about uh, free surface flows, um, we're always turbulent always turbulent and for the easy part of that which is the same as pipe flow then it's just a straightforward expression the more difficult part is where we have these varying flows which are more complicated give us free surface flows kind of an interesting bent to them but uh, that might not necessarily be the focus of what you look at uh, as you go through your stuff so so I, I'll go through I've also uploaded a, you know 20 pages of my notes that you can look at to, which again kind of um, looks at this in longer uh, form and I'll start going through that now and what we don't get through today I'll go through uh, on Friday uh, but any questions yes. yeah go ahead circular where are we uh, the this here yeah it's diameter radius so to the, the most efficient section in a circular section pipe is to be up at the, the waistline of the circle. So if you imagine a pipe is half full, a full pipe, 2R. So yeah. Triangular one, this is a right angle. And this would be a depth, right? So you can work out, so if this is Y, you can work out the relative square root. Yeah. Okay. So I guess this would also be, by definition, this would be 45 degrees. So, right. Okay. Um, so, anyway. So. Done? So it is being recorded, of course. Yeah, it is being recorded. So um, 10, 11, and 12. So this is now up on you know, the website, so you can download it should you so desire. Um, it's divided up into these topics. Um, we've never, well, certainly you probably do know how to do this, but that's OK as well. Um, these are what we've just talked about. So it comes really from killing the, uh, the velocity in the, the system. And strictly speaking, of course, 
Um, these are really for the cases where all of the loading is due to the fact is pressure drag, so-called pressure drag, right? So we have pressure drag, which is the jet engine kicking stuff onto the, the side of the, the truck, where you have a stagnation velocity, and all the momentum from the air, which is kicked out of the 747 engine, is killed as it hits the truck, and therefore that momentum is transferred. Um, in the laminar regime, even though we use this expression, which includes rho u squared, half rho u squared, which is really the kinetic term, in the laminar regime, all of that drag is due to viscous behavior. And that's why it changes with the viscosity, right? So you remember that we talked about this behavior where this is Reynolds number, this is coefficient of drag, this is 24 over Reynolds number. Obviously, in this regime, this is a function of laminar flow, and it's a function of velocity. So I guess this would be viscous drag. In other words, the fluid that parts around this gives a shear stress due to the fact that it's a viscous fluid. And so you'd expect that if you double the, velocity, double the viscosity in this, you'd double the force. That would be the scaling that would work. In this regime, the drag... Um, to draw it slightly differently would be more like it's still a, it could still be a cylinder, but it's really the f the behavior is this, and so this is developing a pressure on here, which is providing this equivalent shear stress in this direction, but it's due to a different mechanism. So that's the other thing to to think about in this, and it makes a difference. So this is a pebble going down through syrup, where you double the viscosity of the syrup you double the drag that's on it. Here, if you double the viscosity of the fluid, if instead of using air you use something with double the vis viscosity, I don't know what that would be, then you wouldn't double the drag force that's applied because it's a function really only of the, the momentum, the density of the fluid that you, you're killing. Here, if you double the density of the fluid, you would double the drag force. Uh, and you notice also that the, the drag force varies not linearly with the velocity, it varies with the square, square of the velocity. Probably more than we need at this stage. Uh, but anyway, so remember the drag equations and how to use them. I guess we said lots of things about them. Remember that uh, A is some characteristic area that would make sense from the geometry that you're using. If it's a sphere, it's be, it would be the frontal area. I guess unambiguous if it's a sphere, it's always going to be the frontal area that you'd see, which is the same as the planiform area, right? So. Uh, if you have a sphere and you're looking at drag in this direction, then the area that you see, if you're looking from here, is just a circle, right? You see this circle if you're looking up in this direction. Likewise, if the flow is in this way, then the planiform area would also be the, the, the same. So if you're looking at lift, for instance, caused by this, which you could get if it's spinning, then you'd be interested in this planiform area, which of course would be the same area. If you're looking at um, objects which are not quite so symmetric as a sphere is, I guess the, a sphere is the, ultimately, the ultimate in symmetry. If you're looking at, say, uh, drag on a plate, the drag would be different. Um, there may be a different area defined in each of these cases. Actually, it wouldn't. No. If you're looking at the drag on this, in this direction, or if you're looking at the lift on this, in this direction, I think you'd be using the same area. It would be this length times width. And so be aware that you, know, you have to think about what this area might be. Density, of course, is the density of the fluid that's flowing around it. I won't insult your intelligence by stating that, but I guess I have. Not the density of the, don't make the mistake of using the density of the object. And so two, two, two modalities to do this in, and there are two examples. Uh, both of them re revolve around this force balance. You have um, the weight of this acting downwards. You have the drag force, which in this case is due to this shear force, which gives you a net drag upwards, curly D. And if you want to, you could have the buoyant force, 
which is just going to be equal to the volume of the object multiplied by its unit weight of the fluid. Maybe it's important if you have quartz dropping down, which has a specific gravity of 2.7 versus water, which is 1.0. So there's a, the density of the fluid in that case is significant compared to the density of the particle. If the particle is dropping in air, uh, you know, air is two orders of magnitude less dense than water, so it would be a thousandth of the uh, density of the particle, and so it's probably inconsequential. But strictly speaking, you might include it. We know that this drag force has to be equal to, sorry, coefficient of drag. Coefficient of drag is equal to the drag force divided through by half rho v squared a. Uh, so we can rewrite this in terms of the, uh, the drag force, which is just going to be equal to coefficient of drag. What was this half term? Is, this is just the Bernoulli term, half rho v squared term. So for sure we know the area. We perhaps don't know the velocity. That's what we're solving for. For sure we know the density of the fluid density of the fluid, and depending on where we are in this, we're either here or we're we're in one of these two regimes. In this particular case, Certainly, we're in here. And so um, we don't know what the uh, Reynolds number is. And so when we substitute for the coefficient of drag, we have this. And if we substitute for Reynolds number, you know, I'm going to run out of space here. What is Reynolds number? Density of the fluid, velocity of the fluid, characteristic length, which would be diameter and viscosity. And so when you substitute in this, you have a velocity here, you have a velocity here, um, and then you get a combined effect of that. The buoyant force, we know, is just um, the volume times the unit weight of the fluid, and the weight is just the volume times the unit weight of the solid, right? And so both of these terms are absolutely defined. It contain nothing, no information about velocity. But this one term, when you pull in the coefficient of drag in this regime, has a, a term that includes velocity, and we solve for it. So, and I think you can, can all do that. It's, it's worked through there, so it's worthwhile checking that out. Well, we're not going to get through as much as I thought about today. Maybe I'm being a bit too pedantic. You can tell me if I'm being too pedantic. OK? So. One regime is where we're in the laminar part, in which case we have a velocity uh, or a coefficient of drag, rather, which varies with Reynolds number and therefore varies with velocity. And so it gets put into this thing overall. So, yeah, OK. And the second one is the, the opposite. I'll scroll down. No, I guess it's not there. So the second one is where we're working in this regime where if we look on our coefficient of drag versus boundary layer effects. And we're in this turbulent regime. So it's air. It's got much lower viscosity. We know that the Reynolds number is equal to velocity, density, um, a characteristic length, uh, let's call it D in this case, over viscosity. And just because of the, the variables that come into this, um, the viscosity is very low. Maybe water viscosity is 10 to the minus 3 pascal seconds. Air is maybe towards the magnitude less than that, 10 to the minus 5. And so this ends up being a much bigger number. Uh, 
uh, even though actually the the density also changes with a um, yeah even though the density changes uh, commensurately right so air is one kilogram per cubic meter uh, density of water is thousand so this is ten to the three different uh, ten to the three uh, lower but the velocities tend to be much larger than they would be in water so I guess that's what cancels out and so in this case uh, again we have the same mass not ba force balance between these. I think in this case, this probably doesn't matter very much because it's very small because of the density of air. The volume of the hailstone multiplied through by its unit weight of air is a very small number compared to the others. The weight is large. It would be the dense, roughly the density of water if it's ice, I guess. And then this coefficient here again is equal to curly drag force is equal to coefficient of drag half rho v squared um, times area. The sphere is nice and symmetrical and so as a result of this uh, we have this v squared term as a result of this, this is constant, so long as we're on the right-hand side of this regime. And then so we end up with a v squared term. I think in the previous case, the v squared and the v cancel out to give just a, a velocity, scales with velocity rather than v squared. In this case, it actually squares the v squared, and so you end up taking a square root, and you can calculate the velocity as a function of this. If coefficient of drag is a constant, then you end up with a single number. This is just all the other terms that go into this, and you end up with velocity. And so you're able to pull the, uh, the numbers out of this. Uh, what else? All right, so same deal, um, I guess. So often we're interested in calculating what velocities are if we have drag on a structure, or it could be lift, I guess, on, a, on a, an airfoil. If we had an airfoil going through the air, if we define a particular velocity it goes at, then we can calculate what the lift or the drag is, um, and vice versa. We can calculate if we know what the uh, the velocity is, the steady steady flowing rate, uh, the rate at which it goes, so the rate at which it sinks in water or sinks in air. Um, it's always relative velocity, so the hailstone. Uh, is going down through static air. You could calculate what the terminal velocity of uh, the guy jumping out at uh, 100,000 uh, feet above the earth, Baumgartner. So the air static, he moves through the air. Or in the case of a hailstone, you have the air going up and the hailstone is static. It's always relative velocity that we're uh, concerned about. I guess the other application are compound uh, structures. And if we want to know what the drag is on a compound structure, we calculate what the drag is on one segment. We calculate what the drag is on the second segment. And we add them together. Not diameters, but drag. These are curly Ds. Not very curly, but curly. And you can calculate what the force would be applied on the structure. So we didn't really do it in very much, well, it's in the videos, I guess, but we didn't do it in much detail. If you want to calculate what the drag is on a, a portion of a car, you get the drag for the, the front end, you get the drag for the windshield, you get the drag for the, the fenders, etc. You add them all together, and you end up with some composite drag to be able to calculate what the drag would be. If you know what the drag force is against uh, that you're pushing against, if you know what the velocity you're traveling at and the drag force, the product of uh, velocity and force should give you the work that you have to apply to overcome it, right? So, um, work uh, equals Newton meters, right? Power equals work per time. Oh, handwriting's getting bad. Newton meters per second and this is what we call power dot in all our stuff so a newton meter per second is the same as a drag force curly d 
multiplied by the velocity it's traveling at. So if you know what the drag force is on a car at 30 miles an hour, and you know it's going at 30 miles an hour, you have both of these parts to be able to figure out how much power is, is sapped off from the car in terms of um, uh, drag that you'd like to minimize, of course. Of course, you'd like to minimize it but not make the car look like crap. So I always, does anyone drive one of those Honda Insights that have the covers on the wheel wells? It seems that those never sold very well. They just were too unconventional. But Priuses, which are obviously uh, Prius Priuses, obviously energy efficient and also hybrids, sell quite well, I think. The Honda ones never quite made it, it seems to be. But the Honda regular body hybrids seem to be. So it seems that aesthetics uh, factors into uh, what, what we might buy. God, it's taken a long time to go through this. All right. Um, any, well, any questions before we head on? Okay. Uh, we've talked about some of these. Uh, we talked about what hydraulic radius is. We talked that Reynolds number is a function of hydraulic radius rather than hydraulic diameter. Uh, we talked about the importance of Froud number when we talk about um, gradually varying flows because it's how the, the stream communicates upstream. Um, but we've said something about that, maybe. Uh, we talked about specific energy for gradually varying flows and for uh, rapidly varying flows. And we've talked about specific momentum for hydraulic jumps and rapidly varying flows. But we've given you a maybe a buy on those. You might really want to look here. We've never defined this. We don't need to. We certainly have defined this in our specific energy diagram. I'll talk about it even though I've told you that maybe you don't need it. Energy, which we call E versus Y. This is one of the times in life that I have your full and undivided attention. I realize that. So I'm going to use it to advantage to some, instill some propaganda. So this is uh, a critical depth. At this point, the Froude number, which is uh, the balance between the rate of flow divided by the celerity wave speed, it's exactly one. And so it looks like dropping a pebble in, and then the ripples from this look like this. Well, that's a pretty good concentric circle thing, isn't it? This is the velocity downstream. You certainly know if you've been to the, our other classes. And I guess we know that this critical energy here is equal to 3 over 2y, 3 over 2yc. And this represents the behavior for a given flow rate, q. One curve for a given flow rate. It hugs here. This, of course, above here is subcritical, subcrit flow. So Froude number less than one. And this is supercritical flow. Froude number greater than one. And if we draw what those look like in our little figure, And this is y, this is y, maybe 1 and 2, and this is a small velocity, and this is a honking big velocity. So this is sub, and this is super. Or right -line. So, um, yeah, I'm going to stop there. We will use um, Friday. I thought we might get through it today, but obviously not. I'm too, being too pedantic about this. Um, so we've defined the stuff, supercritical, subcritical. I've already told you that in this, these boxed uh, areas are the ones you might want to concentrate on. Uh, we talked a little bit about hydraulic jumps. We didn't talk at all about these. 
And so at least that gives you some way to uh, focus. If you are going to do some uh, wrapping your head around things before now and uh, Friday when we'll go through the remainder, then you might also look at things you know we need, which we've already said. Maybe this as well. So if you have these materials, then think about those. So, yeah. So we'll, we'll talk again on, um, on Friday. So we'll finish off going through free surface flows, and then we'll talk about pipe flows, and then we're done. Great. Thank you.